meeting is now being recorded. Great, thank you. And so, as you probably have noticed with some of our last webinars, they are all available online for free for download. Um, so that you can come back to these webinars for reference if you hear something that was of particular importance to you. <clears throat> so moving on, um, to tell you a little bit about the music and the choreographer program, this was developed in response to member requests, uh, you know, how to find and secure music is always an ongoing challenge for the choreographer. And so we wanted to dive deeply into that this year, and that involved three parts. First, we brought entertainment lawyer Corey Field to the Dance USA conference in June, where he met with a handful of our member councils to discuss music rights. Then we launched this three-part webinar series. The first one was Finding Music for Choreography, which featured a variety of different music labels and composers and publishers to help uh, uncover or uh, discuss paths to finding music that maybe not everybody is always familiar with. Um, and all of those resources are available on our website. The second webinar was Navigating Music Rights, featuring an attorney and a publisher. And this was really looking at the legal side of securing the rights and licensing, but really at the 101 level. <clears throat> And then today's webinar is hearing from three choreographers on how they find music and use music in their creative process. As mentioned, we've created an online resource for you to access, and you can also tell us how you find music for your choreography, and we will add those resources to our webpage, as well as you have access to these webinar recordings. This special initiative this year is generously funded by the Virginia B. Toolman Foundation. So thank you to the foundation for your support. Today's webinar is going to be moderated by Christy Bolingbrook. And many of you may know her, but just in case you don't, uh, Christy is the executive and artistic director of the National Center for Choreography at the uh, University of Akron. I first had the pleasure of getting to know Christy when she was the Director of Marketing at Mark Morris Dance Company uh, years ago. And then she moved to San Francisco and was in charge of curation as well as a variety of other activities at ODC Theater. Christy now, since 2015, has been working at the University of Akron dedicated to creating a space for dance makers. This is a beautiful new space with uh, seven major dance studios, two black box theaters, two main stage theaters, an on-campus set and costume shop, and the opportunity for artists who go there to do collaborative research with the scholars based at the university. So it is very exciting for me to have Christy moderate this conversation, not only because of her experience and sensitivity to artists in the field, but also because of this great new Center for Choreography um, located in Akron. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christy, who is going to uh, guide us through today's webinar. Christy. Thank you, Amy, and uh, we'll give you a shout out here from the University of Akron because I have some of my dances and art form students in the room. Everybody say hi. Hi. All right. Excellent. Um, and uh, I'm so thrilled to be able to get to know these artists that Dance USA has also curated and brought together to complete this conversation. Um, to get an idea a little bit before we jump into it, uh, I've worked with Joanna and bear with us, everyone. We would like to try to utilize the survey tool through uh, Global Meet and get a sense of who is in the virtual room with us here together. So we have two poll questions uh, for you. And uh, the first one is, do you identify primarily as a choreographer, composer, or administrator? Uh, and I'm looking for where we can find those poll questions. If you look at the top uh, horizontal navigation and click on poll, you should be able to have a pop-up box and answer those questions quickly. 
So if you identify as a choreographer, composer, or administrator, we'll give that a shot. Uh, the second question, also to get a sense of what your relationship is to music, um, is a multiple choice. And when considering the relationship between music and dance, do you see music as an artistic complement or a collaborative element in your work? Now, we know this is an imperfect question. So the complement might be someone who works with music more as an ambient sound score, and a collaborative element might be a much closer relationship uh, note for note, if possible. And if you are not sure where to locate your work, you have a not sure option also. So by answering both of those two questions, if everyone would in mind, and then clicking on the standard answers, uh, we'll see what results we may be able to view out of that. This is great. Uh, almost everybody who has called in um, has completed the survey. Oh, wonderful. Um, and what are the results for those that uh, are not dialed in via the phone? Uh, this was an experiment on our part. I don't want us to, to struggle too long with trying to make it visible. Um, the results themselves are not showing up in the same way when we prepped. Uh, so we'll keep that as a secret, maybe later on to be revealed. Um, and I appreciate everyone's patience with technology. Dance and technology is a different webinar series. Uh, so to get started, though, a little bit, and maybe jumping off from this, this question about music as an artistic complement or a collaborative element, we've got to have preparatory conversations with all three of our featured choreographers. And by way of introduction, I'm asking that each of them share a brief snapshot of their work, explain how does music factor into their creative process. Uh, and to start us off, I'd like to invite Milan to introduce us into her work. Uh, I will be providing a sense of time, because I know that everyone has stepped into their day. Uh, so, Mulan, I will give you a, a, a five-minute mark if I can, um, just if you can't read each other's body language. But please, provide us with a snapshot. How does music factor into your choreographic process? You know, I was when I was hearing the word, first I want to say thank you, Christy, and to Dan CSA for this invitation. Um, and I'm so excited that there's so many students in the room who are um, going to be changing the world with their dance. So um, I think we were going to be showing the slides of our work while we're talking. Is that yeah? So um, here's a beautiful uh, image that uh, starts to describe this quality of collaborative element, which was in the survey. I think of um, well, maybe I'll start with uh, the, the core of the question. Um, I started by listening to CDs and radio and getting inspired by great works from contemporary Native composers like Robbie Robertson and Ulali, who are now considered classics. And in those days before internet, it was kind of hard to figure out how to reach those people. So things would be relationship-based. So I'd go up to um, the Ulali singers after they'd been performing in New York. And you know, I didn't have any resources to, to, to uh, you know, you know for, for, for legal rights and all that. but. Legal versus ethical, you know, like if you're going to use something of someone's, you want to ask permissions and you make an offering. Maybe it's a card, maybe it's a little gift or a little, you know, a little nice piece of food or something. So those might not have been all legal, how I first got permissions, but I was building relationships. And that continued until I started to, um, uh, in 15 years ago, I founded Dancing Earth, which is an indigenous contemporary 
dance company, and I was reaching out towards young, talented Indigenous people for Dancing Earth, and many of them were multi-talented, including music, um, you saw uh, Quetzal Guerrero, he's a wonderful musician, he's leaping in there, he's a musician, a caporista, a break dancer, and a painter, so he was one of the first uh, young men that I was commissioning work from. Um, here you're seeing a, a scene uh, from Walking at the Edge of Water, and this shows that both the music and the dance are always in the service of a greater theme of a performance. So in this performance, we were being invited by elders, um, including Mari and Mari Mumford and Anishinaabe grandmothers who are walking at the edges of the Great Lakes to um, uh, build an awareness of the sacredness of water. So Sina Sol is in the center, and she is a Yoruba priestess was given permission to share a water song, a Yemanya song, on behalf of water. So this is a ritual within a performance. And then you are popping ahead to the next frame, which is at Alcatraz Island, soon after sunrise on the first Indigenous Peoples Day, as declared by the city of San Francisco, which is on occupied Ohlone lands. And here you're seeing some examples of our musicians. So we're integrating, um, in this piece, traditional songs of Ohlone and Pomo um, origins but with contemporary dance, which is quite a departure. That's not usually something we are given permission to do, but in this case, um, it was considered appropriate for the theme, which was about re-indigenizing urban space. Um, we also have a musician, Esme Olivia, who is working with uh, some of the traditional singers to create new songs that were composed with Pomo and Ohlone language that she was given permission to use um, by different culture carriers. And Ross Kitty, who is an incredible hip-hop artist, he created a new track of a traditional song with the second half remixed with house music beat. Again, quite um, quite innovative and something that we, we seek permissions from elders um, before we take that kind of um, innovative liberty to make sure that we're not disrespecting or causing any, any harm. But and in fact, there was a lot of excitement about what we were doing because it was um, thought of as a way to keep young people interested in traditional um, language and song. And then the next frame is the DJ. We work with DJs who are sometimes looping in live sounds um, as well as recorded voices of uh, culture, culture carriers and elders who have guided the work and um, also sometimes the voices of dancers who might be talking about um, their own tribal relationships with the theme, for example, with water which is how I learned about the very personal impact of oil drilling on communities in the far north in Canada or of um, in the desert Shoshone people having their water diverged to Las Vegas. So I, I'm, I'm learning along the way through these um, soundscapes and um, hopefully um, delivering that message to audiences. And in the last frame, we're looking at um, a canyon. And this is where I start to consider it, um, how place impact sound, and while we see a big, vast uh, canyonscape here, um, it is a little uh, cumbersome to try to amplify, you know, through speakers and chords and all that, and so often our sounds that we use in these kind of um, uh, natural stages might be more intimate, and where you might be hearing a sound like around the corner from a tree, a little whisper from someone, or a, a quietly sung song that nobody else is hearing, so it has more of a, an interactive quality where it's more intimate and more of a journey. So I guess the overall question is, I, I locate sound um, through this collaborative and relationship-based process with community members, and that it is, again, uh, bringing together the music, the dance, the story, the language for a purpose, for a greater vision, for a, a bigger intention and theme. Thank you so much, Rulon. I'm really struck with your collaborative approach to sound, um, that it still often is in a very porous relationship that you've made room for that. I love this idea of the whisper of the leaves or the, the trees in the background, um, things that you can't always rehearse and plan for when you're in the studio. Um, I, I wanted to also just Yes, go ahead. Chris, I, I came from a, a more formal dance background in New York and, you know, with long rehearsals and, you know, beautifully sex that uh, took a lot of time to build. 
And frankly, we're working in much more guerrilla style circumstances often um, where, you know, for me to aspire to have something that's the same way every time is, is it, it, it's an, almost an impossibility. So I'm moving in a direction that is more um, responsive and emergent, which I feel like is a, an approach that, that honors not only the places and the people, but the, the moment in time. So that, that's, um, and definitely working with break dancers has helped me get there. They're so, such great improvisers. So a big respect out to anyone who's um, in that in that forum in, amongst the, uh, the students who might be listening. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, for all of our listeners uh, who are playing along, I want to also acknowledge we have put together a tight agenda today, but we have left room at the end for questions from all of you. And I encourage you to submit those questions in through the portal's dialogue uh, utilizing the app. We'll also put a call for questions uh, at the end. But don't fear that you need to hold back for any reason if you are inspired by hearing one of our choreographers speaking uh, while they introduce themselves. Um, so we will make space also to make sure that we hear from you. So thank you. Um, why don't we pivot now and we'd love to hear from Stephanie Martinez. How does music factor into your choreographic process? Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, hi, students. Uh, it's it's amazing that you guys are getting to um, you know hear hear um, everyone's story. And um, thank you, Rulan. That was that was really uh, pretty cool. Um, as far as uh, how music factors into my creative process, uh, I really I don't want to say it's secondary, but the first thing I do is, is that I always conceptualize and, and I write a lot. I read a lot and I try to have a strong sense of um, my environment, where I'm at, you know, in space. Uh, I don't do, uh, at this point, a lot of site-specific work, which is, you know, something that I, just looking at these beautiful pictures before, I would love to uh, have an opportunity to do, but most of my stuff is on uh, main stages or like black boxes, um, stuff like that. So um, as far as the music, uh, you know, it is, it is you know, one of my biggest factors. You know, I spend a lot of time and a lot of my energy just sifting through music and things that I like, and then I try to build a, a library so that I have something to go back to um, when the time comes. And depending on my concept, uh, I can – you know, then return to some of the stuff that I've liked or people that have composed music for me. So I have a little bit of both, uh, but it's definitely the conceptualizing and uh, writing that happens first, the music, and then for me the steps is actually the last thing that I, I try to, you know, conquer as far as, um, you know, putting together uh, a ballet. Uh, let's see. Well, and this oh, okay, go ahead. Oh, well, Stephanie, I, I was remembering from our prep talk um, that you are very deep in process right now with the new work uh, for the Joffrey. And um, part of this, this question of putting out your wish list for music, uh, would you mind sharing a little bit of, of how that's going right now? Absolutely. Um, actually, I'm in, it's with the Charlotte Ballet. And then the, which is, um, I'm in deep process right now, and then I, I'm going to be doing the Joffrey, and that's going to be live music. So we can talk about that uh, after this. But I have, basically, I, I, what I do is I have a wish list. So I have a bunch of music, maybe 10 tracks, or, and then I give it to the administration, and I say, tell me if this can happen or not. And so, uh I haven't heard a no yet, and I think they're still in process of seeing if they can get the rights to the music and if that's something that we can do. And if not, I always have a plan B, or I'll have somebody here in Chicago write something for me. So I, I always try to have um, myself covered. So I'm in process of just waiting to hear back. But like I said, there's, there hasn't been a no, so I'm hoping that that's, you know, uh, a positive thing. And when are you supposed to go into the studio for that creative process? 
I go, I actually start January 1st. So uh, okay. Yeah, so it's coming up. Uh, so, yeah. you know, I, I'm really looking forward to it, and uh, I'm planning on using, you know, the tracks that I've, you know, put down. And if I do have somebody that's writing some music for me as well, so this this ballet is about 45 minutes to an hour long, so I have him weaving transitions. I also have him doing a men's section, so it's not mm. just all... You know, it's it's a little, it's a bit of a plethora of of a bunch of different things together. So somebody that's actually composing music for me, making transitions into something else, um, another track that I've chosen, or something classical or something you know neoclassical. So he's really threading it all together for me. So I have a soundscape uh, designer. Mm. So it sounds like in that spectrum of artistic complement to artistic collaborator, you are, are very much in the middle of that spectrum. But it also sounds like it's not a linear process. And I think a lot of times there's a misconception, um, so let's say from the general public, uh, that music or a piece of music has this sort of dance locked inside of it. So all you have to do is just choose a song and, and open up that dance, right? And then, uh, as we're digging into this, it sounds like it is not so simple. And we know that that's also not true because there are a lot of choreographers who have used the same pieces of music. That may, when Mary comes to mind is both New York City Ballet and Mark Lewis Dance Group, uh, to Brahms Music Theater Waltzes. The two works could not be more different, although it's the same sound score. Um, so I appreciate that. That's a turnaround, and I hope that maybe we can hear a little bit more about the original composition when we get to our Q&A portion later on. Okay, absolutely. I'm uh, looking at some of these pictures, and um, this is this piece was designed or redesigned. It, it first uh, was in a laboratory situation with uh, Ballet Hispanico, uh, the Choreografico Instituto, and it was uh, it was unnamed. Now it's called Dos Lados, and I uh, took it. I, I did it with the company. I created it for the company, and um, I was able to take the piece with me, which was fantastic. And uh, you know, it, I would show people would ask me, "Let me see your work," and "Let me see the music." And so I sent it to Moving Art Cincinnati and the Kansas City Dance Festival, and they uh, commissioned it. And it took on a life of its own, and now is, um, you know, I'm very, I'm very proud of it. So it, it kind of went from one laboratory now to the main stage. So it had a, had some legs, which was, which was nice. I, I, I started it in 2015, so it's been kind of sitting somewhere, not having a home. But they gave me a home for it, so I'm uh, very grateful for that. Cool. And is that then the, the group picture, is that also uh, Los Lados? Yes, yes. The, those are dancers from Cincinnati Ballet and the Kansas City uh, Ballet Company. Beautiful. Are, they, yeah, they come together, which is kind of cool because they get to, you know, they're always dancing with the same people. So um, there are three artistic directors, and they uh, formed this summer gig, I guess, where – um, these dancers come together not really knowing each other and dance together and then they choose choreographers and um, like a plethora of just different types of choreographers too and they come in and they create on these dancers and you have about a week or two weeks depending on you know what your time frame is and then you have uh, you know a couple performances which is you know really nice and you meet new friends and you make new connections and it was it was just a fantastic experience. So I work to have a life outside of, of just a single company or a single city or engagement um, is equally exciting, and you may not know the answer to this, but uh, for our listeners' benefit and consideration, I'll offer the rhetorical question that uh, having three different artistic directors and entities also come together may have also shared with paying some of music rights. Um, would be my guess in terms of aggregating resources. Um, so that that would be an interesting thing to consider too. 
Absolutely, I, I am sure of it. What what I do, what I've heard is that when you know companies already acquire, uh, they have to pay a certain fee. I think a year, mm -hmm. and, um, so that they can have. So the fee is this is this is what I've heard through a friend that writes here in Chicago is that companies already pay a certain fee each year, so it covers like a general umbrella of musical rights, but then they still have to go to the artist and make sure that this is okay to put on stage. So I think they're already paying a, just a fee up front to be able to even uh, be allowed to use the music. And then the next step is um, going to uh, the publisher or, you know, whoever's in charge of um, the music. That, that, is, that is what I was told through um, somebody that is a composer and that writes a lot of music um, here in Chicago. I just talked to him a couple of days ago. And uh, right. I think he would be a great resource for you guys as well. Um, he's got a lot of information on this topic that would continue to, um, I think, be useful to a lot of us out there. Yeah. Well, to dig into that a little bit, and I know um, some of you know, just in putting out this webinar series, resources have come up. People should always be encouraged to send those along to their GSOs and can add them to the resource page that Amy pointed out at the beginning. Um, because I would say, first, this music and this dance, uh, it's the blessing and curse that there is no one way to do it, but you do have to be somewhat uh, uh, the scavenger hunt, um, and same things for the internet now, as we long acknowledged, um, to be able to hunt down some of these artists and how to connect with them, um, and, uh, you know, make sure that you're also doing right by them when you are incorporating other artists into your creative process. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to pivot, uh, and set ourselves up for Sarah. Sarah Wright. Um, who is calling in from the West Coast. We are literally from all over. Um, so Sarah, it's a, yet another perspective uh, and introduction. How do you factor music into your choreographic process? Awesome. Well, hello, everyone. Um, well, yeah, so as a tap dancer, um, I started when I was a little girl, five years old, and I was studying piano at the same time. And um, and then the, the more I studied with various dance tap teachers, I eventually found this woman named Denise Shearer, and she would bring a drum set to class and would hand out sheet music for us to read, to learn and read. And I, I was very much aware of quarter notes and eighth notes and things like that, so I'm like, this is interesting that we're doing this in tap class. But she really kind of made it clear to all of her students that tap is music. And mm. that every every note that you tap can be notated musically. So I was around 12 years old at this time. So that was my first um, experience with understanding tap as music, even though I had been tap dancing forever since then. Fast forward to high school years, I was really into jazz music and loving all, all styles of jazz, Latin jazz, various um, styles. And I w remember listening to all the melodic horn lines and thinking, this is what I hear in my head when I tap dance. I hear these melodic lines and, and these kind of bebop phrases. And, gee, how cool would that be if I could eventually write music? But at that point, I'd stopped taking piano. So I was like, well, I should have stuck with piano so I could write, you know, really fulfill this idea. Uh, and then years later, I was actually working with musicians, and I was going out every night to um, nightclubs, jazz jams, funk jams. And actually, Rulan, I know Quetzal, uh, is oh. a violinist. So, yeah, we, yeah, we met at the floor at a very, very cool jam session in Hollywood. And um, anyway, so I started meeting with these uh, musicians, and then I started collaborating to write music. And what you're seeing now is uh, my album that I just released on August 31st. Um, as you can see on some of the titles, I have uh, names like Harold Cromer, Ted Lewis Levy, Brenda Buffalino, Jason Samuel Smith, Arthur Duncan, Ivory Wheeler, and Diane Walker. 
Um, these are all legends in tap dance. They are all my mentors, and um, I wanted to have them on the album, uh, so not just to only showcase original music written stemming from tap rhythms, uh, but also to showcase names in tap dance that people don't know of. I, I've found, and the tap dance community has found, that we're we're still very underground, and uh, people don't really know what's going on. So um, I've used this album as an educational tool uh, as people listen to be kind of schooled on the art form. Uh, there's a song, track number nine, called The Groove, and in that I use vocal excerpts from 1980s documentaries on tap dance, and you can hear like old mm. legends like Jimmy Slide and John Bubbles and Sandman Sims talking about the art form, so uh, that's The Groove. And then all the other tracks in between are original songs, except for the last track, My Baby Just Cares For Me, that's a cover. And that's with Scott Bradley from Postmodern Jukebox, who um, I've toured with um, as their featured tap dancer, which is amazing to help get uh, exposure for tap dancing. And they're still touring now. They actually have two tours, one in America, one in Europe. Anyway, um, so yes, this album is called New Change, and it's on Spotify and iTunes and everything. So I encourage you all to take a listen if you can. This is me at the studio uh, at Bell Sound Studios in uh, Hollywood um, in the booth. Which was really cool, just to, you know, to to experience the recording process of recording tap and how I want it to be listened to versus seen. Uh, of course, I have some music videos for some of the songs because people want to see what it looks like. But I really wanted this to be an experience for for the for people to listen to the intricacies of tap dance as a percussive instrument. We have a toe tap and a heel tap. And the toe tap is, is like our snare drum or tom-tom, depending on how you hit it. And the heel tap has more of a darker, deeper bass tone, so it's like the bass drum. So uh, the way I've been writing these songs are kind of stemming from the melodic tonalities of even just the tap shoe. Um, you can go to the next. Oh, so that's me now with Artya Manukian, who's a cellist from Armenia. And we collaborated. We wrote a song together called Revive, and that's our recording session um, of the track. And then that's me with Postmodern Jukebox. <laughs> I just love the photos. It's fun. And then the last one, yeah. last two, yeah. is um, my students. So the, I also do uh, intensives. They're called the Tap Music Project Intensives. And students audition from all over to be a part of this intensive. It's usually about five days long, five hours a day. And now I'm teaching students how to read and write rhythm notation, how to, and then I have live musicians in class. So we're now learning how to talk to a band. Because most TAP students don't even have access to a band. So it's like, okay, we do a lingo. Because we have to approach this like jazz musicians that we are. So how do we talk to a band? How to make an arrangement? Um, how to handle yourself at a jazz jam. And then we also write music, and I give them a first-hand experience on how I have collaborated with musicians, and then I'll give them the opportunity to pitch in an idea, you know, and we can say, all right, where should we go from here? And then a student will raise their hand, let's do a stop time, or cool, or let's do a, let's go to Latin feel, like, great. You know, and, it's just, it's a, and then we end up having a couple original songs that we perform, and that's a photo of us after the showcase here in L.A. this past summer. And these are all killer students. I mean, these guys are the future of tap dance. They're all phenomenal. We have some students from Mexico, from Australia, from the UK, uh, from Spain, uh, and all over the U.S. So I'm, I'm happy that now I, I'm, I, mean, I can also, I love teaching, so I'm happy to be able to share the process of this so that, you know, hopefully in the future more tap dancers will uh, experience a recording or start writing their own music, and then we can have tap dance respected as music and as a uh, as artist in that kind of way. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you bring so much up that actually is, is in common with what Ulan was talking about in terms of leaving room for the improvisation, it being a very collaborative atmosphere and environment. But what I also am struck that you bring up is uh, a different kind of idea of what archiving dance could be, because you know, we know dance and live performance being as ephemeral as it is, we have videos certainly, but different forms of archiving or sort of these elements of what's left behind, the trace of 
of what the dance experience has been can also be the sound. And that, as a part of it, is really interesting, too. Um, not to mention, I turned with them to distribution. You know, I, I, I don't know of any other dance artists who have made a CD. Um, so that's pretty cool, too. Yeah, thank you. And what, what, what's cool, too, about some of these songs is I will first write them from based from an improvisational idea, and then once the song is completed, then I will choreograph to it. And so then I also have instructional videos on, on a, my Vimeo channel so that tap dancers all over the world can learn these pieces. So like right now, I'm going to tour for next year to travel across uh, America with a band and performing all these songs. But I want to pick up local tap dancers and say, hey, have you learned it's happening? If so, you know, there's an instructional video on mine, and then come perform it with me on stage. So something fun nice. to kind of like in include the community everywhere. Very cool. Excellent. Thanks. All right. Um, we did prepare a, a couple of round-robin questions that I'd like to pose to everyone on the panel before we open that up to any of you as listeners. Um, and so please be completing or and adding your questions along the way so I know how much time and I'll leave as much room as possible at the end if, uh, if need be. Um, but I, I wanted to bring up you know, something that this reminded me of when we were preparing for this discussion was uh, David Burns' book, How Music Works. And for those that haven't read it, it's not about how his music or the Talking Heads music works, but really looking historically at how music, uh, you know, originally, especially a lot of the classical music that's played in huge concert halls today was originally composed and designed to be played quite privately in small salons uh, in a chamber setting. And it is because of the uh, advantage of technology um, and acoustics development that we might be able to, you know, uh, now house 1,100 people or something like that. So I was really curious to ask uh, all three of our artists if when making their musical choices, are they considering a specific venue in mind um, and, uh, you know, how they might respond to something like that um, in terms of what the musical choices might dictate some of those other practical considerations? Um, would one of you like to, to start or, or respond? This is Rulon. Hi. Yes. I was I hoping you'd it. speak up, given your outdoor, okay. huge, gorgeous nature venues. Yeah, well, I think besides um, the, the unconventional space, you know, I love doing work in theater because everything is set up for the purpose of, of being able to hear and see. And um, But that's not always an option that's made available to many choreographers, particularly choreographers of color. I, I, I love to see that continue to break down. I think there's still room for that. Um, but meanwhile, mm. we're bringing to life many powerful unconventional spaces from streets um, to canyons to um, other places. And it, it looks very beautiful in photographs, but it's quite difficult and actually quite expensive in certain ways because you have to um, bring in your entire sound system. And we're usually mm -hmm. on a small budget, so that means maybe we only can have one speaker, but we have to make our way through the entire uh, canyon or the entire street procession going several blocks. So then you have to make it mobile. And mm -hmm. I'm actually very interested in off-grid um, for my environmental reasons. So we've been experimenting a lot with how much battery power can we get from a solar-powered system or from a bicycle-powered um, system. And the answer is not as much as if you have a uh -huh. loud oil generator. So. We're doing a lot of problem solving if we're, since we're making works that are um, often they are ecologically focused. As I said, that's one of the um, uh, one of the charges that we've been given by different native elders is to um, create works that center where we all have common ground, which is this earth. But if we're going to make those themes, I'm looking at how do we execute those themes in a way that isn't you know huge on the carbon footprint and creating more toxicity. And it, it's quite a challenge. It's you know, we've been um, sort of like lulled into these comfort zones of, of uh, technology and 
uh, without considering what sources those technologies. So in some cases, the answers um, are, uh, come back to very original technologies, original sustainable technologies of you know, a man on a drum or a, a live song. Um, on the other hand, we have incredible young, talented Native artists in Dancing Earth who are creating um, you know, boundary-busting combinations of traditional songs with cello and spoken word and environmental sound. So when they create those tracks, you know, how do we how do we make them so that they can be heard? And uh, you know, often we've got a big message that we're trying to get get out to people. So sometimes that message is felt um, deepest when it's very quiet and intimate, where you have to go towards that space to hear it. And sometimes it's more overt. Um, I personally mm. love live music, and um, that sometimes uh, is like I said that the um, the solution to some of these problems, but in other situations it can be um, difficult and expensive because of the different wires and the costs of, of uh, bringing in musicians, or maybe we're invited to a very, very small space where we can't have the live musicians as well as the dancers. So there's certain pragmatic things that shape these choices, but mm -hmm. I do know that um, that vibration of the live sound is what I'm, what I'm wanting to achieve for every witness and participant, um, that, because sound is actually movement, it's vibration. So how can that vibration sort of permeate through the cells of the body um, and looking at different ways to navigate and problem solve in order to, to achieve that? Yeah, no, the, the, the cost prohibitive nature of live music, I think, is kind of an eternal question. Um, it's similar with dance. It's a lot cheaper to tour a solo than it is a, a group of nine. Um, and I've certainly seen applications and, and had conversations with artists who, when they premiere the work in their home community, that may include a, a live band, and then they dance to recorded music when on the road, um, or if it is a translatable score of some sort, not unlike Sarah's uh, idea about inviting local tap dancers uh, to perform with or in respond to, um, but certainly when it comes to classical music sometimes, then I know companies will also tap local orchestras so that they don't have to cover the added expense of touring with those productions, because that can be a part of it. Um, Stephanie? Or Sarah, did you want to add anything about musical choices um, with specific venues in mind or dictating um, specific practical challenges? Um, yeah, yeah um, sure, I'll go. Okay. <laughs> go ahead, Sarah. Go ahead, Sarah. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, mine's very simple. It's, it's just uh, bringing tap to a concert stage. Um, I'm sorry, music venue versus Aha. the concert stage, right? So uh, even just kind of broadening people's minds on that, like, oh, we're going to see a tap show at a music venue. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thing. So that's that's my only contribution to this, an this uh, question because that, for me, is already a big deal for tap dance to be seen yeah. in that type of venue and, and things. So that's kind of the goal. With, with my project. It, it also it affords a new opportunity. I, I think about going to my first orchestral concert, and I was a seat filler down front in the very first row, where I will admit my somewhat snobbish music friend informed me that that was not where the best acoustics were. Um, uh -huh. But to me, being able to experience it in that intimate format was beautiful. I was so much more engaged to get to witness their the musicians' faces. So when you were talking about mm -hmm. um, choreographing the movement uh, and what what the dance will look like after you've designed the sound score, um, that reminded me of that. And then thinking about having the opportunity to see a dance show in the close proximity of a music venue, whether that's a Joe's right. Pub. Um, in New York, uh -huh. or you talked about participating in some jazz jams that are in more of a nightclub feel, um, there mm -hmm. are different opportunities than what's traditionally available on the proscenium concert hall black box theater stages. Uh, Stephanie, exactly. you wanted to chime in. Oh, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, this is all very helpful, actually, for me, too. But as far as my own, uh, you know, where I'm at right now, I had it made me think of something that I hadn't actually thought of. I, I My sister had composed music for me. She's a, a Latin composer here in Chicago. Um, and she, I was doing something for the St. Louis Dance Festival for a company there. And she and her band said, oh, we can go, we can, you know, we can play the music live. I'm like, are you sure? Yeah, we can do it. That's fine. Even with the, you know, the limited budget. And I said, great. Um, so she made this whole score, and it was based off uh, Gabrielle Mistral's, um, uh, she was a Chilean poet. And so we were trying to infuse um, some of her text in with uh, my sister's music. And again, you also have to get rights for text. I didn't know that. I found that out mm -hmm. the hard way. But that's another conversation. Um, and mm -hmm. so we get there, and there, you know, it was a huge theater, but then there were some to-dos with the union that they couldn't be there. So they, so they basically could not perform live because of some union rules. Ended up using oh, their set up the technology. Then, Yes. So what mm. I thought was I still wanted that live component. So I had her teach some of the dancers how to play drums. So I integrated <laughs> that into the dancing. These women were playing these big drums on stage, walking around with them. So it was really part of the, the scape of the whole piece. It, it, I hadn't wanted to design it that way, but it felt most natural because I really wanted – some type of live music on stage. So really had to, you know, think on the fly when I was in the studio, how am I going to make this happen? Because that was really part of my um, submission for this project, mm -hmm. that there would be live music. But these these logistic things kind of got in the way, so I had to figure out, okay, how am I going to make this work? Um, and it was, it, was, it was pretty cool. I mean, and I think the dancers nice. actually enjoyed being a part of it. Instead of just dancing to people drumming, they were actually drumming. The women were drumming and the men were dancing, which I thought was yeah. kind of cool because they were making they were making them work really hard. Which is <laughs> um, you know, absolutely it, it was kind of an, yeah. Yes. I love that. I do have a couple of, of questions. Improvisational, uh, here like in the if room. I go faster, you go faster. You know, if I go slower, so everybody had to be very sensitive to what was happening on stage, which gave it mm -hmm. another type of texture, you know, because it wasn't this thing that they had rehearsed, but it was this thing that was going to happen live, so everyone mm -hmm. needed to be, like, on high alert, which is kind of fun. And too. the listening, and, and I, and too. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The, the um, like I said, the sensitivity of it. Yeah. I have a couple of questions, and I know that we are, are winding down, so I, I'd like to pivot to our broader Q&A. So please type those in if you haven't sent yours already. Um, I have a couple here in the room. One of them, um, for any or uh, all of our artists, is public domain music gaining any popularity uh, among dance companies and artists um, since obtaining rights can be such a challenge? Do you think that that's a trend or something that's happening right now? Hmm. I mean, Sarah, you even on your CD, you made a cover uh, of a song. Did, did this concern about rights? Did that somehow inform your decision about what music or what song you chose to cover? Uh, not necessarily on the actual song. I I actually didn't want to cover on the album at all. I wanted to just be proud and say it's all original. But my producer was mm -hmm. like, no, we have to have a cover. So, um, but that's just a, a kind of, and, and, you know, Scott Bradley is the king of the covers because Post Martin's box is all covers. So I kind of went to him for advice and he said it's fairly easy. You just have to go to the fairy, uh, sorry, Harry Fox uh, agency that uh, handles covers. So you kind of just have to pay a fee to use it and give the credit mm -hmm. and uh, give them mm -hmm. the, the, the split and right and royalty for it. 
Well, it, in related to this question about, you know, some music in public domain, and I, I don't have a comprehensive list in front of me, but one of the other things that comes up is that those are very known entities, right? It, it takes a lot of hutzpah, I think, to come out and say, I'm going to do another Nutcracker, uh, or I'm going to use Steve Reich or Philip Glass, or I'm going to do another Rovell's Bolero, uh, Goldberg Variations. All of these things, I think we know several choreographers have done their own iterations thereof. Um, is there something appealing uh, to working with such a known entity, and, and what are the challenges maybe with those? Well, this is Mulan, and I just want to say that I, I tend to prioritize making opportunities available for under-recognized global indigenous musicians and dancers mm. um, to be heard and mm -hmm. seen in an effort to sort of undo the silencing effects of colonization. But on occasion, I have used what I described as indigenized remixes of Bolero and Philip Glass, his Aguas de Amazonas. There's, um, the, the renditions I used were with a group called Uakti, I think is how it's pronounced. And they're using pre-Columbian instruments, which um, mm. like I said, is my way of uh, sort of indigenizing those, um, those sources. Yeah, and shining a light. Like when you choose a collaborator or a musical complement, it is not merely because I quote unquote like this song, but really doing it with intention and purpose behind that is what I'm hearing there. Thank you, Rulon. Um, I have a, a couple more questions. I have one for Stephanie and one for Sarah that I'd like to, to squeeze in here. Um, for Stephanie, why are the steps the last thing you decide when you choreograph? Uh, well, it's, well, mainly because I don't have my own dancers. <laughs> I, mm. uh, you know, I am an independent choreographer, so, you know, how I work is um, I will make a bunch of source material here in Chicago, you know, phrases and it, stuff like that, and then I take it, and then I see how the dancers respond, because, you know, every, every dancer, every uh, organization is different. Even in the ballet world, you know, they, they move, they're individuals, and I do not see them as, um, you know, these, you know, like whims, you know, these people that are at my whim. I really want to make sure that it's a good fit and what I'm giving them feels good and feels like something that they can accomplish. And sometimes um, it's, it's just a matter of getting to know them. I mean, a lot of times I have them right. We don't even, you know, I'll give them source material, and then I have them write about themselves because I really want to know them. And that goes in with my conceptualizing at the beginning. You know, I have this idea, I have this story or an abstract story, but I want to know who are the players and, and, and what are they about so I'm not just ornamentally putting something on top of them. Uh, and I feel like it's more satisfying that way for them. So that's, that's really the main reason why the steps are last. Um, but also, you know, because I don't want to get, I've had choreographers in the past that like, this is what it is. They make every step up and you know, each body is different or maybe I'm not feeling it that way, but you know, I did it anyways, but I feel like for me to get mm -hmm. the best results, it's a bit more collaborative. And um, if, you know, of course I have the last say, if I don't like something, it's not working, but there's always a conversation happening, and, you know, that's really important for me when I go into the room to get to know who I'm working with. Cool. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and Sarah, uh, mm -hmm. I have another question for you here. Um, because you do write the music, you can compose the music, and then also choreograph the steps, do you find one or the other to be harder or easier uh, and if you might explain or talk about that to compare and contrast them a little bit. Sure. Uh, sometimes they actually ha happen simultaneously. Uh, for example, one of the songs, Gemini Vibe, the step that I improvised, I then kept. <laughs> so it's like I'm <laughs> improvising this idea. I have this rhythm. One, digga, 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 da, digga, 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 ga, ga, ga. Great. Sax player learns it. Cool. And since I already like that step, I will just keep it. So then 
I've just improvised, but then I've also just choreographed at the same time and composed at the same time. <laughs> so there's so that. similarly, or, it's not a linear approach. It, it's one that can ebb and flow, and, and, and it sounds like each each song might have a, a different approach, but you have a couple of sure. tools that you can sort of rely yeah. on. Right, and there's one, It's Happening is uh, the name of it, where there's a stop time section. So I kind of just compose the hit. Uh, to be syncopated, and then I would choreograph the tap section for that, matching those hits. Um, you know, so it's, it's all very interactive between the improv, the choreography, and the composition. So it just varies. Nice. Thank you. Um, we we mm -hmm. participated a little bit online in a dialogue with Alexander, who brought up an important question uh, about being the creator um, and how do we uh, resolve around having such a male-dominated field? A lot of our composers that are perhaps better known or perpetuated are male-dominated. I, I think some of what Rulan has brought up, um, both online and in the chat room and on the phone, about selecting your music and uh, composers or collaborators with great intention, um, is, is one of the elements to do that, but I also want to acknowledge in closing Dance USA, uh, I think very consciously and specifically selecting three female choreographers to be mm -hmm. highlighted today. So uh, thank you to Dance USA for providing this yeah. platform and to all of the artists for being so generous and open about the vulnerability of the creative process. Uh, Amy or Joanna, do we have anything else to say before we sign off? Thank you so much, Christy, and thank you so much to Rulan, Stephanie, and Sarah for sharing your experiences. I know this is just scratching the tip of the iceberg of how choreographers work with music. And um, please do visit our website. We'll share the recording of this webinar, but as well as the last two webinars, um, particularly the middle one, if you have questions about music rights and licensing, we know it is such a beast um, to navigate that world. Uh, so thank you so much again for all of you for joining this. Thank you to the Virginia B. Tolman Foundation for your support, and I hope you all have a wonderful end to this calendar year. And with that, we will be signing off. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Nice to meet you guys. Yes, we'll see you in person when you come to Cleveland for the 2019 Dance USA conference this June. Oh, that would be awesome. Thanks for the invite. Wow. <laughs> that would be great.